Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about acoustically treating a home theater. Is it worth it? So I'll just start with saying this probably sounds totally self-serving since Pose Acoustics, acoustic treatment, I sell acoustics, I tell sell acoustic design, I do home theater design. Sure, it's self-serving, fine. <clears throat> I think that at the end of the day though, you've all had this common experience, which is that speakers seem to sound different in different rooms. Uh, some rooms just don't seem to sound very good. And some systems that have very, very good equipment don't seem to have a good end result. And the thing you can point to in every one of those scenarios is going to be sound quality. It's gonna be acoustics, I'm sorry. That's what's affecting that sound quality difference. So. Let's talk a little bit about what it is, how much it costs, and what's, you know, what's worth it or not. Obviously the cost of acoustics depends a lot on the room because treating a room is about getting sufficient area covered with acoustic treatments, meaning larger rooms have more area to be treated, cost more money. That's because there's a sort of minimum per square foot, if you will, of cost for the acoustic treatment. Now I'm not gonna get into DIY, DIY always changes things and you could spend just as little or as much or even less or even more whatever on DIY because it completely depends on what you're doing. What I think though is that for a lot of people there's very little advantage to DIYing. You can get a really well constructed acoustic panel wrapped in fabric for $80, $100. Um, you probably will spend for the materials and everything, 50 or $60 to do it yourself. But if you do it in small quantities, actually potentially more, you could spend more money than it would cost just to have the, the product made for you. Um, and in that $100 or $80, whatever, I mean, that's just a number I'm throwing out sort of on the high end. You may be able to get panels as cheap as $35 to $50, something like that, uh, you know, if you look around enough. So cost-wise, I would just say, a small room with a very modest amount of treatment probably would be about $2,000 for something that's just the most basic acoustic treatments. So we're talking like basic fabric wrap, two inch panels, that's it, just enough to cover the walls, maybe one base trap, kind of in that price. Up to sky's the limit. I mean, you could easily spend $100,000 plus not including labor. So what's the difference between that $2,000 system and that $100,000 system? Well, for the sake of argument, I would say treating even a small room correctly probably is going to be more like four or five thousand dollars using stuff that's just really basic. So again, two inch to four inch panels, uh, sufficiently covering the wall, basic but functional diffusers, the kinds that tend to cost about one fifty to two hundred dollars a piece, um, and, and enough base traps to maybe do two corners, something like that. Right? That's probably we'll say for the sake of argument about five thousand dollars. And I could equal that in performance and spend $100,000. And the difference would be this, it would be the aesthetics. So that $100,000 system is probably gonna have all the same stuff, but you're not gonna see it or it's gonna look a lot more aesthetically beautiful. The diffuser isn't gonna just be some wood panels or polystyrene, more commonly either vacuum form plastic or polystyrene um, diffusers. They're gonna be something that's maybe like, you know, 3D, uh, Printed, that's actually a new thing now, is architectural features that are 3D printed. So it could be like a 3D printed one, or it could be fiberglass, or fiberglass reinforced plastic, or it might be wood, but it's gonna be like beautiful woods, maple, walnut, oak, something like that. Beautifully finished, larger, everything's probably gonna be, you know, bigger scale panels. We're not gonna do acoustic panels you hang on a wall, we're gonna do um, what are called uh, fabric wall system, which is stretched fabric, and then the absorbers are gonna be behind it. Maybe they're higher tech absorbers where we're using special compounds um, or layers of, of materials to get better performance out of it. Maybe we've got, I, you know, I showed this recently, the Art Novian Sienna, which is essentially a slat system. So it's like a you know walnut in my case, I have black lacquer, gold. I mean, there's lots of different finishes you can get. Those are really expensive, and if you start to do enough area in the room and you do these neat custom multi-layered systems, that's now as much interior design as it is, and it's like custom interior design, as it is acoustics. And so you're talking 100,000 on up. You could spend a million dollars. I actually have looked at interior systems that were very cool to achieve a certain look and performance where the net cost, this was admittedly included labor, was about a million dollars. 
shockingly expensive, but when you get things that are that custom and that fancy and the room is large enough, that's what it costs. So that's kind of the price range we're talking about. And so the, uh, you know, is it worth it? Just depends on what you're trying to achieve. I think what people mean when they say, is it worth it, is more of the benefit subjectively to the system. So most very small rooms that are not, not very small, most I'd say like average to small rooms, that are not dedicated rooms, but more like a mixed use living room, will have carpet on the floors, um, or at least some carpet, like maybe at least has you know a, a area rug of sufficient size, a big comfy couch that's fabric or maybe leather. It's gonna have um, pillows on the couch. You know, you're gonna have curtains on the windows and, and maybe you've got big sliding doors, maybe they also have curtains. You've got bookcases built in, something like that, right? This space that some people have may actually be naturally acoustically treated enough that everything's fine and adding additional acoustic treatments will not net a huge benefit. But that's not necessarily the normal today. Minimalism has actually gotten very popular. One of the things that minimalism did was it popularized things like roller shades instead of curtains. Roller shades are not that great acoustically. Um, one of the other things it's done is it's popularized very clean, hard floors. So tile in Florida is very popular, or stone. We, I have polished concrete. I mean, that's like one of the worst acoustic materials you could have. It's as bad as, as a polished stone would be. Uh, wood floors are very popular, also not a great absorber. So even an area rug may not be enough in a situation like this. If you've got big windows, big bare walls, let's just say you have a very minimalist couch with no or little pillows, and we'll just say it's leather, which is more reflective. This room may not actually have enough natural absorption in it, or diffusion for that matter, to sound good. In my own family room, which has 12 foot ceilings and everything I described to you, it has uh, either no curtains or roller shades, big bare walls, um, everything's reflective. The couch actually is fabric, it's not leather and it is big, but that's the only thing that absorbs in the whole room is that, and uh, I think it's eight by 10 area rug with a pad. It's not a very thick one either, a quarter inch. So that room has an RT60 time of around two seconds. It's way too high. Like, at a bare minimum, I would have liked that room to be around half a second. The target for, for dedicated theaters is 0.32 to 0.35. That's roughly the range we like to target. So I'm way, way off of that. So what's the subjective effect of a room like that? And these rooms are not uncommon. Well, you tend to get reflections that are such that it actually hurts speech intelligibility. So some reflections can help to benefit speech intelligibility because they're actually making it louder. But when those reflections become more delayed, they smear the sound of voices and they make it worse. So it just depends on the kind of reflections. Early, early reflections help speech. Later reflections hurt speech. So that's a problem. Um, it affects the sound quality. So rooms that are not well treated and have much more reflections and have a higher reflected to direct ratio or a lower direct to reflected ratio, the inverse of that, um, what happens is that that tends to be true at high frequencies more so than at low frequencies. Most rooms actually have a similar amount of reflected to direct energy at lower frequencies because it's harder to absorb that. It's really at the mid and high frequencies where the biggest shift takes place. Well, <coughs> excuse me. What that does is it makes the system overall sound brighter. So it can actually be brighter to the point of being unpleasant and har harsh. Um, it can also be frequency dependent, meaning that what we're getting is actually reflections which are hurting the timbre of the system in such a way that you get things like that cupped hand voice sound that isn't very pleasant at all, or a nasally sound that's kind of like this. And so we that's not a good thing. We don't want to have that. And acoustic treatments are one of the ways to improve that. And what I see people do is they tend to spend money on speakers instead or on better treatments, uh, better electronic treatments, I should say, like DSP. So I'll have people call me and they'll say, hey, I want to get Dirac, I currently have Odyssey, here's the thing I'm trying to fix. And when they go through it, what I hear, I worry Dirac, which I do think is potentially better than Odyssey, I like it better myself. I think though that the difference between Dirac and Odyssey is not gonna fix the problem they have because that's not what those two systems were designed to fix. It may make a modest improvement, it may, but I think that the real issue they're having is probably needing actual acoustic treatments. And that means adding absorption in the room. 
So that's one of the things. The other one is that getting the right ratio of absorption and diffusion. So acoustically treating a room doesn't necessarily mean adding treatments. It means getting the right amount of absorption and diffusion in the room that you need to get the right performance you're looking for. Some rooms actually have too much absorption. Sometimes that's because somebody, let's say, DIY'd it and they just didn't know exactly what they were doing and they put too much in there. So one of the things that happens when the decay time gets too quick, so too high, uh, well, too low, the RT60 time goes down, the decay becomes too quick, too high, is that um, things, artifacts that would otherwise be covered up by reflections then become, they are laid bare, basically. Comb filtering is the main one. Now you might say, well, my system doesn't have any comb filtering, why do I need to worry about it? It does, all systems do. So when two speakers combine to create a phantom image, the midpoint of the phantom is the maximum point of comb filtering. So all stereo systems, for instance, with no center channel have comb filtering with the center image and it affects the uh, sound quality. But with a room that has a reasonable amount of reflections, when those two speakers are playing, you've kind of maximized the reflections in the room, that comb filtering tends to get filled in and you don't notice it that much. So one of the reasons why we don't tend to hear this obvious shift when we get a center image versus panning left or right in a typical properly treated room is exactly that. And in a surround system, you still have comb filtering because between the left and the center, that center point is gonna cause comb filtering with the sides, same thing. So if we overtreat the room, that comb filtering becomes obvious and it's not good. <coughs> Excuse me. So we don't wanna overtreat the room um, it also tends to make the speakers more localizable. So one, the same thing that reduces apparent source width and the same thing that tends to create that very pinpoint laser-like imaging also makes the speakers less likely to disappear. And so what can happen is as the image pans around, we hear it snapping between speakers more than having this sort of almost speaker invisible panning of just, it's just around us, it's immersing us. And so you want to have the right amount of reflections, not too much, but definitely not too little. And I see that a lot. I've even, my last room, in order to try to kill some problems I was having that was slap echo really, the room's RT60 time dropped lower than I really intended it to. And I then spent a whole lot of work trying to get back the nice even panning Eventually I did, and the RT60 time never got that high. I think, I think I eventually got it around 0.3, but at one point it was like 0.25. It was really low. And there were certain things about that that I liked, but there was a lot of things about that I didn't like. And the fix ended up being adding in some diffusion, including a lot of absorption was concentrated on the front wall, which I usually don't think is such a bad thing. But with the carpeted floors, the uh, treated front wall, and the treated rear wall that had a substantial amount of absorption, with fairly large absorbers on the sidewalls at the midpoints, I ended up having to add in diffusion to a bunch of these places to get back what I needed, and it helped to improve the panning when I did that. Um, and at one point, I even removed the side reflectors, the side absorbers, I should say, completely, and I didn't even put anything back there and just let the sidewalls be completely reflective with all the absorption on the front wall, back wall, ceiling, and floor. Um, and it actually sounded to me, at least with some speakers and some materials, sounded better. So the point is, ideally, you don't want to be doing that. You want to actually engineer the whole thing right and treat it correctly. But, but point being, subjectively, the improvement is improved voice clarity, less edginess, um, better panning, and uh, improved upper bass response and less droning, too. That's another one I didn't talk about yet. So. Um, Multi-sub works, but it only is going to work to about 80 hertz, maybe 100 hertz with a higher crossover point. Beyond that point, you really need the room's own damping to help. And a lot of rooms don't have a ton of damping there. Some do. So walls are lossy, and the, the walls actually could serve as sort of like base traps in that range. But definitely that's pretty limited in range, and you're going to see usually a big jump between 3 and 500 hertz. And so if you treat the room, that stuff happening between, we'll say, 500 hertz and 100 hertz then benefits from that. And having thicker panels, like four inch or six inch panels, further benefits that particular range. And so that could be a good thing because getting rid of that droning is really important. Um, and then I mentioned already the overtreatment problem. I do want to kind of talk about that again. So we don't want RT60 times to be too low. It makes the comb filtering more obvious. Uh, the rooms are not pleasant. 
So when a room's RT60 time is dropped to around 0.22 seconds or below, we consider that effectively anechoic, and they're not necessarily great spaces to be. I know there's gonna be some people who say, well, that's my room and I like it, which is fine, but it's generally not something we target. Um, apparent source width, as I said, can become so small that the speakers become too localizable and the images themselves are not very realistic. They actually are smaller than life, if you will. They don't match the size of, the, of what's going on on the screen. Um, and so generally you want to get it all right, but acoustically treating a room at the end of the day I think is necessary. It, it, worth it seems like the wrong way to describe it. People are spending a lot of money on things in their home theaters that I think are far less important than acoustic treatment. So I would say, for example, that unless you're just somebody who could care less about sound, if what you're going for is an overall good experience and you have, like everyone else, some fixed budget for what you're trying to spend to get certain results, you need to look at compromising other things to fit in a sufficient amount of money to acoustically treat the room. Going with too nice of a projector, for instance, is potentially going to lead to too small or too incremental of an improvement in video relative to what the next level down projector might achieve if that difference in price, for instance, nets you acoustic treatments or not. So for example, I'm a big JVC fan. I really like their projectors. I think that the bottom line projector, which doesn't have wide color gamut, is a good projector, but I would prefer to see going to the next one up, which is a lot more money. I think it's like $9,000. So let's say you go up to the next level. To me, that's worth it probably. I'm gonna guess that's not gonna be the shift that you would be in where you would suddenly not be able to do acoustic treatments. The difference between that projector and the next two models above it, to me, are not worth it if what you're gonna to have to give up is acoustic treatment. The benefit of acoustic treatment far outweighs the small incremental improvement in black levels and the small improvement in sharpness. Uh, every other difference between them, to me, it's just, there's, it's just not worth it. It's just not there. Uh, same with the, the, the Sony lines. I don't remember the models off the top of my head, and I probably should, but going from their lowest price model to the next one up uh, is a pretty good improvement. In, uh, actually, in their case, the contrast gets much better. It's a little brighter. As you move up beyond that, the difference between them is much, much smaller. And I don't think that that difference is worth it if what you're getting is, as, as I said, no acoustic treatment versus something. With speakers, if someone said to me, well, I'm gonna use the line I sell because I know the line well and it works for this description. I can afford the R series or the S series, but if I get the S series, which is the top of the line series, I can't afford to acoustically treat the room. What I would say to you is, get the R series and acoustically treat the room. Because putting the S series in a dedicated home theater with no treatment at all is probably not gonna make you happy. And you're gonna have spent all this money on speakers and you're gonna think that I sold you the wrong product, that I sold you a pieces of junk. And I've had this happen not actually with the Perlison. Uh, amazingly, even in fairly untreated rooms, people have loved them. So they're a really good speaker. They do have some advantages for untreated rooms that make them work better, but I still think treatment is important. But I've had other speakers that I've sold where people bought them. I know them to be a good speaker. I know that they sound good for the price point. And then people put them in a bad room and then they come back and they say the speaker is harsh and the bass sucks and I'm just not happy and these are not what I wanted. And we look at the measurements and it's really obvious that the room has so many strong reflections and is so reverberant that that's what's dominating the perception, not the speaker. And in many cases, we will add a very modest amount of absorption that really only takes the RT60 down a small amount, not enough to hit the targets. And yet the person comes back and says, I can't believe what a difference it made. Like this is night and day. It is much better than it was. And I'm really impressed with the sound quality. Um, you know, we actually, when we're designing systems, we have to make choices again. There's budget and there's just room compromises that come up. So when I'm treating family rooms, this is the most common one. So it's not, budget often isn't the thing that's causing the problems for me. It's an aesthetic issue related to the fact that these are family rooms or living rooms or you know, in some way a mixed use space. They're not a dedicated box that I can put everything I want in the way I want. So what happens is the client says, look, 
I can't cover all the walls. So here, we can do something on this wall as long as it looks like a feature. We can do something on this other wall that looks like a feature. Um, maybe we can put something on the ceiling. I need to know what it's gonna look like, blah, blah, blah. Uh, nothing can go on the front wall. There is no back wall. No, it's not uncommon. Or maybe there's even only half a side wall and no back wall. This room opens up to another room, whatever. So the RT60 time comes in at one and a half seconds untreated. I can't get to 0.35 seconds in that scenario. It's impossible because I would have to treat all the other adjacent spaces and I would have to cover most of the immediate room just to get that RT60 down. And it's gonna cause other issues because now I'm observing some useful reflections too. And yet that 1.5 seconds is not gonna sound good. So what do we do to fix that? Well, actually adding a modest, maybe 100 square feet, maybe even less, maybe only like 50 or 60 square feet of absorption in that scenario would still make a subjectively big improvement. And so it's worth doing even if we can't do it right. There, there are some things in life that are not worth doing if we can't do it the right way, but acoustic treatment's a little different. While I would say adding, for instance, two two by four panels, so that's eight square feet each, that's 16 square feet total, is gonna make almost no to no difference at all in the sound quality of a system. Adding more like 50 square feet in a typical room is. And yet, in a, in a room like I mentioned before, you actually need around 275 to 300 square feet of absorption to really bring that RT60 down to where it needs to be. Um, especially if you space the panels, you know, because you get some advantages from doing that. So, um, you know, it's in, in that example, doing way less than you need to do to get the RT60 to hit the target is still fine because we've gotten to a point where we hear the difference. I will say for some people it's addictive <laughs> and there is some cost issues. So when aesthetics are a major part of the problem, and, and I had this scenario recently where aesthetics were a huge issue, unfortunately, aesthetically beautiful acoustic treatments cost a lot of money. So to get that roughly 50 square feet of aesthetically beautiful treatments was something like, I think it was about five or $6,000. The improvement was so substantial that the person wanted more like right away. And they said, what else can we do? I mean, it's like, this is so much better. I wanna add more. And there wasn't a lot of space left because of all the other problems in the room. So we could do the ceiling. There were some other parts of the walls that we didn't do that we could do, but to maintain the look, because they were originally designed to look like features. So to maintain the look, we had to design in more features and make it look good. It was like another 50 square feet is gonna be another $5,000, and that's just how it is. And so we would be looking at a $10,000 treatment at that point, which was out of budget. And, and that still, as I said, was a third of the actual amount of treatment the person needed that would have been way, way out of budget to do. And there wasn't enough surface area in the room to cover to do that. So um, w to answer the question I started with, is it worth treating a home theater? In, de in dedicated rooms, it's a must. In non-dedicated rooms, it depends, but it's still very likely to be a must, especially in the way rooms tend to be decorated today. You don't need to do it all. Not only can you do it in phases, but you can make a substantial improvement without actually doing everything you need to do to get it right. And I would say that next to the quality of speakers, the acoustic treatment is the next biggest benefit in the home theater experience you're gonna see. It needs to be treated just as important as the projector, the screen, probably more important than the screen to be honest, and the speakers. It should be placed way above things like speaker wire or the rack or the power conditioners, or any of the other stuff that we spend money on, that we need to spend money on, but that can pull away from important aspects of the budget. So yeah, acoustic treatment makes a difference. Very important. And it definitely needs to be part of your budget. As I said, at the very low end, you should plan on spending about $5,000. And for $5,000, you're gonna get utilitarian treatments that look like utilitarian treatments, but are gonna provide sufficient improvement in sound to be worth it. If you're trying to achieve that look that you've seen in on the forums or in high-end home theater magazines where it's just this beautiful, I'm not even talking about like theme theaters that look like the Batcave, but just this beautiful room where you just have fabric with 
you know, metal lines down the fabric making these design details end to end and you've got little wood inserts and you've got these beautiful chairs and the whole deal. That interior that you see that's fully acoustically treated and then has that cool acoustic look, they probably spent six figures on that. So you do have to understand that there's a cost of entry. Um, I do know some people who have DIY'd that I mean, even the material cost for fabric walls is pretty high. You're probably looking at five to $10,000 in track and fabric to do uh, all of the walls of a typical room. Um, if you're doing the ceiling and all the walls and you're doing a lot of details, and like I said, you're adding in some neat things, like maybe you're gonna make some wooden boxes uh, that kind of add some accents. I've seen that done, it looks really cool. Maybe you're gonna do some slat walls as well. You know, that's gonna add up too. So uh, the, the slat materials, walnut, something like that, and then finish nicely can cost thousands of dollars. And so even DIYing, you're probably looking at ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, plus then all the labor to do the work, if not more. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's just what it costs. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, but as I said, I think that this is a part of the general cost of a home theater that gets overlooked. And I think for a lot of folks, the utilitarian approach is fine. It leads to a home theater, I mean, you're gonna turn the lights off and watch a movie. So it's cool to have a cool looking room, but it's not, especially if it's a dedicated room, it's not absolutely necessary to look cool. And so I would say to folks, you know, trying to make it look cool by just not treating the room is just wasting everything else you've done to make this a high performance home theater. Treat it, and if it has to look good, I'll work with you, for instance, to try to come up with a design that looks cool and you know is as modestly cost efficient as it can be. I'm as cheap as anybody, so I will happily sit there and help you think of ways to get a certain look for the least amount of money. I've done the same thing in my own case. Having said that, I've still spent a lot of money and did so because it was the only way to get there from here. It was the only way to achieve the look I wanted and the performance I wanted with the uh, degree of detail that I was looking for. So again, yep, worth it. We need to treat rooms. It's, I think, underappreciated. I hear people say it all the time and I still think it gets underappreciated and it's not done nearly as much as it should be. I hope you found this video helpful. Um, I'm hoping to do a lot more of these relatively short, this one wasn't, it was almost 30 minutes, <laughs> relatively short videos that provide useful information. Thanks again.